Well, hi everybody, it's Greg, and today I want to talk about my experience with these phantom quadcopters that I've had over the last few years. Some of the things I've learned, I want to help you maybe avoid some of the mistakes that I've made. Overall, I'll say this is a lesson in how to not crash your phantom quadcopter. Uh, let's start out with my first one. This is the Phantom 2 Vision Plus that was such a revolutionary product of its day just uh, three years ago. So as far as I know, this was the first quadcopter of its kind that came with everything you needed to get going. It had the stabilized camera gimbal, which was a big deal, three axis stabilization, so really smooth um, videos, no matter what, what kind of movement the quadcopter was doing, this would compensate for that movement. So uh, you had that was a big plus. And then of course, all the other things that uh, the, the, the GPS and other navigation aids that are built into the aircraft itself, uh, to have something that was ready to fly out of the box, as they said, with, uh, with everything you needed and uh, really great video quality for its day. This was really a revolutionary product. So I got one, it cost me, um, if memory serves, I got it with a spare battery, so it was like $1,250, I believe, at the time. So this was um, in the summer of um, 2014 when I, when I got this one. And so um, what I learned, I learned an awful lot from this one. And uh, the first thing I learned is I had to calibrate the IMU. That's the inertial measurement unit. And so uh, after it had been in transit, you know, manufactured in a box, whatever shipped around until it finally came to me, I suppose the IMU uh, had been bounced around so much in transit that it just needed to be calibrated. And the instructions did not say anything about uh, calibrating it right out of the box, so I didn't. So the first time I tried to lift off, the first thing it did was just, just that. And uh, so I stopped, I tried it again. Finally decided, well, maybe I just need to work the controls so I'm trying to go forward and try to lift off. And of course, it was a disastrous crash the first time it left the ground. So um, I was devastated after having spent all that money. No major damage, but I had to use the spare props and to get going again and um, got it to work. The, 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 after the IMU calibration, it was much more stable much better flight the next day when I, when I was brave enough to try again. So um, the next lesson I learned, however, just a few days later, after I had everything calibrated and I had a pretty stable flight, I was flying around and uh, decided to bring it straight down at the end of the flight, just, you know, land and bring it straight down. And I learned <laughs> the hard way uh, that that's that's not a good way to go. Uh, what happens is when it's flying, there's this mass of unstable air beneath each of the propellers. And if you're coming straight down into that unstable air, you may lose the ability to, uh, to, to you know, it loses all of its lift and just comes down like a rock. Uh, it's a little disconcerting because you don't expect that to happen. It flies so well otherwise. So I learned that uh, when you're coming, when you're landing, if you're going to come straight down, you, uh, you got to be very, very slow. But the better thing to do is as you're bringing it down, you can just maintain some sort of lateral movement, either, you know, forward, backward, left, right, or some combination of that movement as it's descending. And then you're avoiding the unstable air that's immediately underneath it. So you'll get a much more stable descent if you do that. So that was a, a, a very important lesson. Again, had a bad crash. I ended up uh, with, with my initial bad crashes breaking these uh, propeller guards, but I got an extra set. And of course, also breaking propellers, but I got extra sets. And so I was able to keep going with just some minor uh, replacements uh, of, of parts. Uh, never anything that damaged the, the camera very badly. However, I did have occasionally uh, from the beginning, uh, sometimes the camera would just kind of jerk up and down a little bit for, for no apparent reason. And when it did, I could bring it back and maybe just restart, or, or sometimes I would just physically uh, tap this front of the camera down with my finger when it was turned on, and it would settle it down and it wouldn't do that thing anymore. So I, I always wondered if I didn't do some sort of damage to the gimbal that very first time that I crashed it. 
uh, the very first time I tried to fly it. Uh, but for the most part, it, it, I, I was able to use, uh, the gimbal was fine for a long time, and uh, I got frustrated because I wanted to be able to use this quadcopter commercially, and uh, of course the FAA didn't have a practical way to do that with the Section, one, uh, the, well, section 30, 333 exemption um, required you to have uh, a normal pilot's license for a, a, an airplane that carries people. Uh, before you could all, uh, adapt that to, to use one of these for commercial use, like if I want to make videos for someone and with this and sell them the video. So um, it, it took you know, more than two years since I bought this before they started the Part 107 designation so you could get an airman certificate that was only for small uh, UAVs or UASs or whatever you want to call them. Uh, drones, of course, is what everybody calls them. So. Um, so I just continued to fly this just recreationally for hobby, whatever, and just get really good at flying um, so that eventually I could get my Part 107 Airman Certificate and start charging people money for doing videos and photographs for them. Uh, so I kept this going as long as I could. I know they came up with the Phantom 3, the Phantom 3 Professional, and I didn't jump on those because, again, didn't want to spend the money if I couldn't use it commercially. Um, in the meantime, there's one other major lesson I learned uh, with the Phantom 2 Vision Plus, and that was battery maintenance. Pull this out here. Okay, one thing that I uh, had a habit of doing with uh, anything else that I used with rechargeable batteries is that uh, as soon as uh, I, I drain the battery, I'm out in the field, whatever, I come back, um, before I put everything away, I put the battery on the charger, charge it up fully, and then put it on the shelf so it's ready to go the next time I want to use it. Turns out that's not a good idea with these um, lithium polymer batteries. They're best stored at about 50%, although I found that if you drain them down lower than 50% and store them that way, it's not so bad but you do not want to fully charge them and then put them on a shelf and not fly for a few days or a couple of weeks or however long it is before you use that particular battery again. And when you have uh, one or two spare batteries, if they're all charged up and on the shelf and then you use one of them and the others are still on the shelf, you know, it's just not a good idea to have them fully charged. Uh, you start to notice um, the battery performance is bad when you're using the battery but you can also see some actual physical evidence of something wrong with the batteries. Now this battery here has uh, kind of some solid plastic uh, framing around what is a bit of a softer material, this darker gray material inside. And what you start to notice when the battery is going bad is that this softer material here almost kind of puffs up like it's just been inflated a little bit inside. And that's a, a physical indication that the battery has some problems with it. This, this looks like a crack, but that's actually just a scuff on this um, plastic framing here. So I started to notice it was much worse on another battery that I had. I noticed this puffiness and thought, well, that's strange. I wonder what's wrong there. Um, but, the, but the real problem uh, occurred when I, when I stuck it in the, in the Phantom and tried to fly. Uh, the, of course, the app will show you right on your screen um, your, your battery life at that moment. So to say, well, you know, your battery is fully charged or it's 90 percent or it's 70 percent or whatever. And, and, and it tries to also tell you how much time remaining so that you know when you got to reel this bird back in, as it were. And so uh, what I found was that I take a battery that was fully charged, start to use it. And after just a couple of minutes, instead of more like 20 minutes that I expected, uh, it would suddenly show that the capacity had, had dropped dramatically and that maybe, you know, it's a low battery warning, you should land now. And I'm like, well, I've only been up there for a couple minutes. Um, that was an indication, you should take that seriously, that your battery, something wrong with your battery, you're just going to have to not use that battery anymore. I know it's hard because batteries cost a lot. You want to use it as much as you can. So, well, it's not that bad, but I did have some bad landings, some hard landings, some crashes because the battery was suddenly not strong enough to keep it up in the air. So I think, oh, I'm okay, well, maybe I've, I've got a minute I can safely bring it down. And the thing would just say, no, 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 I can't stay up here any longer. And it would just come down very hard, very fast. So um, again, 
I think it's a battery maintenance issue and uh, if I would say when you're done with the flight don't fully charge the battery right away unless you think you're going to be flying within the next I don't know 24 hours uh, otherwise put it on the shelf wait until just before you're going to use it and then charge it up so those are the major lessons I learned from the Phantom 2. The last lesson was actually based on uh, uh, trying to drain a battery. I, I had fully charged a battery expecting to do a flight uh, one day and then that flight didn't happen. So the next day I thought, well, I'll just go fly around for a few minutes to drain the battery before I put it away. And during that flight, I was not paying attention to where the quadcopter was just for a split second as it was moving away from me it hit an obstacle, crashed to the ground, and at that point actually finally did some damage to the camera gimbal that was uh, going to be too expensive to repair compared to the price of simply getting what at the time was available as the uh, Phantom 3 standard quadcopter. So rather than repair this, spend less money to just get a whole new quadcopter. That's what I did, and that's when I finally upgraded to this to the Phantom 3 standard. So this is the Phantom 3 standard and uh, I've, I've added some neutral density filters on the front so that causes the camera to kind of tilt down when it's not powered up. But uh, yeah in, in most respects it looks an awful lot like the Phantom 2 Vision Plus and um, it, it is very similar uh, aircraft however Everything about it is better than the Phantom 2 Vision Plus. The, uh, the motors are improved, the, the camera is much improved, and uh, the app is a better app when you're trying to control it and you know, look at, on your little screen there at it. Everything about it is just better than the Phantom 2 Vision Plus. And this thing, complete, cost me about $500 with just, you know, just with the one battery. So um, it was a great step up. And, and by the time I got this, I was such a good pilot that there were no hard landings or crashes, except there was one time when, <laughs> uh, you know, when you've got these, uh, these propellers that are kind of, uh, they're self-tightening. So I used to put them on and just kind of put them on like that and figure, okay, that, that's it, that's all I need to do, and then, and then fly. And um, this has kind of an active braking system, so there are times when the motors are, are just, you know, changing their momentum very quickly. And I guess one time, uh, hard to tell exactly what happened, but I think one of the motors slowed down just enough, and this propeller wasn't on there quite tight enough, that it actually came off in flight, and all of a sudden it's trying to maintain itself with just three propellers and it just tumbled down. It was, it was horrifying. Um, managed to get it all repaired and since then, instead of just uh, calling that good, I give it just another little, just hand, hand tighten there, just make sure it's a little bit more snug. And ever since then, it's been fine. So apart from that one crash, again, learned another lesson. Um, I've not had any crashes, any hard landings, any problems with this, I'm a much better pilot. So, um, so I, I guess um, you know I did go with the, uh, the neutral density filter option since this is the Phantom 3 standard. Not a lot of places will uh, offer neutral density filters, and the neutral density filter helps to lower the shutter speed when you're out uh, shooting video in full daylight. So I found this um, from a guy named Dave Ditzler in Chicago. And what it is, it's just a little 3D printed ring that he made. And he cut off some, some pieces of uh, neutral density gel, this this flexible gel stuff. And so you just put that here in this little, this little ring that then just, uh, just easily presses on and stays pretty snug right there in the front of the camera. And there's your neutral density filter, which doesn't add a lot of weight to the front of the camera, so it's not going to put any strain on the gimbal there, and it, uh, it uh, accomplishes the purpose, and you can, uh, you can put two, you can put a combination of different densities, you can put two or three of, of these little gels on there, and get the level of uh, neutral density that, that you like. It, so again, it's just, 
If you're not familiar with, uh, with that, it's uh, something that's very common in photography when you want to actually lower the amount of light coming into the camera so that you have a little bit more latitude uh, adjusting shutter speed and uh, ISO and some other things rather than just having to rely on you get, you know, full, very intense light coming in there because it's full daylight. Using neutral density filters, you can, you can ad adjust how much light is coming in, which allows you to then fiddle with some of the other controls in the camera. So, uh, and, and it's called neutral density because it's this little gray filter, which is, is supposed to, if it's done right, if it's designed right, it, it only lowers the amount of light coming in. It does not affect the color of the light coming in. So it's not like it's going to make everything look a little purple or a little bit blue uh, compared to not having it on there. It's a neutral density filter. So anyway, I've been very pleased with the Phantom uh, 3 standard, but we're still not up to the full standards of something like the Phantom 4. So uh, finally, after I got this, I got my FAA Airman Certificate, Part 107 Certificate. So now I have the ability to have clients and, and do video and, uh, and still photography, aerial video, aerial still photography with a Phantom and charge money for it. Therefore, I figured I could go ahead and make the investment and uh, step up to the Phantom 4 Pro. So this is the Phantom 4 Pro. And um, I haven't learned anything from this one because I haven't had any problems with it at all. How about that? No hard landings, no crashes, no mistakes, no uh, severe pilot error going on here. This one, I'm a great pilot now, and uh, this one flies really well. Now, it has uh, sensors front and back for obstacle avoidance, and also on the sides, and also um, you know, on the bottom. So it's supposed to automatically uh, stop itself from crashing into things. Uh, I have not... <laughs> <laughs> tried to rely on those automatic sensors. I, I still try to stay very far away from any kind of obstacle that I might bump into. So um, while, while I appreciate the fact that those sensors are there, that's not the reason I got the Phantom 4. <laughs> I got it because it's 4K. Uh, everything about it is uh, the latest, greatest um, technology that DJI has to offer in this size of a, of a quadcopter uh, flying camera. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, uh, how, how to not crash this? Well, you could go through uh, two other quadcopters learning, learning from all your mistakes and then get this, and then that would be a good way to avoid crashing this because you've already learned all your hard lessons. Uh, the other thing is just uh, just be very careful with it. I've, I've seen reports online, you know, some people try to rely on these sensors in order to save them from stupid mistakes. Don't do that. If you think, you know, <laughs> there's, you know, there's a big fence over there, there's a building there, there are trees over there, then stay away from them. That's, a, you know, don't, don't make this thing uh, don't, don't force it to test itself <laughs> on how well it can make up for your carelessness, okay? So, uh, again, battery maintenance. Um, this, the propellers go on, they kind of click on, and there's really no question once they've been properly put on how solid they are. But it, it's a good idea before every flight to just double check, make sure your pel propellers are good. And, you know, even if... Even if you're um, being very careful, you're not crashing or anything, there are bugs up there in the sky. So, you know, check the edges of the, uh, of the propellers because they can, they can get little nicks and dings and stuff just from running into little gnats and bugs and stuff. So make sure you still have some spare propellers around. And when in doubt, they're not that expensive. Just get new propellers, you know, just, just take them off, th throw them away, put them in your scrapbook, whatever, get new propellers. And, uh, and uh, I would also say, you know, Try to protect the lens. Uh, there is another adapter from, again, uh, Ditsco out of Chicago, where um, I can use the lightweight little gel filters for neutral density, and I, and I ordered from him uh, a little ring that I can use on there. Or you can get some more expensive um, neutral density filters where you kind of screw this, uh, this thing off and put on a neutral density filter and, and what have you. But uh, yeah, like I said, Learn from, your, learn from my mistakes, learn from uh, your past mistakes, 
and then you should probably never crash your Phantom 4 Pro. Uh, one other thing, you know, people have told me, and I remember when I first posted a video, they said, oh, don't use prop guards. These propeller guards, just don't take those off. Don't use them. And uh, I, will, I will say, uh, and the reason people were saying don't use them is they thought that it uh, limits the maneuverability of, of the aircraft, that, uh, you know, it's, just enough, it's affecting the airflow enough that it's not as responsive, perhaps, as it would be without the prop guards. Um, I will say that uh, the fact that I did use prop guards on this Phantom 2 Vision Plus probably saved me a lot of propellers that otherwise would have broken. And uh, the other thing, with all my problems I had with hard landings and crashes any time I had a mishap with this guy, I never damaged anything but the quadcopter. So if I hit the ground or hit some other object, I never did any damage to anything that this came in contact with. All I did was damage props, prop guards, and eventually the camera gimbal. So uh, they are safe. Drones are safe. These drones are safe. So <laughs> and I, I do think the prop guards were a good idea here. I have a set of prop guards for the Phantom 3 that are um, easily removed, and I've used those from time to time, especially if I'm just in a situation where you just need that added layer of security. Um, the, you know, if there's just something around you that uh, you just want to be extra care careful about, well, what if this quadcopter does have uh, some sort of mishap? So I'm an advocate of, of um, prop guards, although I think I am experienced enough now as a pilot that I really don't need them as much as I did uh, in the past. And as far as I know, the Phantom 4 prop guards, um, well, the Phantom 4 Pro prop guards are different from the Phantom 4 prop guards because they have to uh, accommodate for these sensors on the side. So they can't quite come around as far Otherwise, it would reduce the ability of these sensors to work properly. So uh, mm -hmm. as of this recording, um, when I've seen official prop guards for the Phantom 4 Pro, they're still a, a pre-order item. I think I will get them because they are also very easy to, uh, to put on and remove. And, and in certain situations, I think I just want that little added layer of assurance that everything is safe. Dep just depending on the exact situation of your flying uh, environment. So anyway, I hope that helps you to uh, have a more enjoyable time with your quadcopter. Don't crash. You don't have to crash. Learn from everyone else's mistakes and have a good time. And I will see you again later. And see, this battery is charged. I better go fly this and drain it down a little bit before I, before I put this on the shelf for a few days. You know, that, that's always a good excuse to tell the wife. I better go, I, I've got a charged up battery. I better go drain it a little bit. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be back in about 15 minutes, but I gotta do something, you know, because uh, you know, I can't put this on the shelf fully charged. That's not good for the battery. Okay.